You're sitting at home when an idea comes to you. It's fully formed and completely finished. You can see it on the shelves. You get excited. You write down these ideas and it builds and it builds. You've got the marketing campaign worked out. Then suddenly another idea comes and it jostles for position, pushing the first idea out. But hold on, there's another idea coming. There's a problem. How do we stop all the ideas from coming? How do we control these ideas? And how do we select the best idea to work on and move forward with? In today's episode of Rebel Entrepreneur, I have the guest presenter, Alan Donegan. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Welcome, Alan. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be on my own show. (laughs) I feel like saying, welcome, pull up a chair, it's your chair, but uh, have a seat. Would you like a coffee from your own kitchen? That sort of thing. I love this. I've been looking forward to this. And of the, the takeovers that we're planning, you're the first, Stephen. So, oh my yeah, please do tell people. I feel honoured. Who are you, and who who is this person running the Rebel Entrepreneur Show today? Okay, so my name's Stephen Lockyer. I live in Leafy, Surrey, in the UK, and I work partly as a teacher and partly as a puzzle writer and puzzle designer. I am someone who has quite an affliction and. I need help. And Alan is today going to be my counsellor. So I'm going to use Alan's expertise and wisdom here and cure me of my difficulties and my challenges. And I think this is something that quite a few people who are innovative and entrepreneurial suffer from. I may be wrong. And this is something that maybe Alan, you can share with us. But I certainly think that you can be, you can get caught up in choke from ideas. What's your first thought on that? It's absolutely correct. We actually get three types of people who mainly come along to our live physical events. You get the people who don't know what they want to do and they're paralyzed by, I've got to pick something, but I don't know. You get the people who've had one idea for their entire life. Like I've always wanted to run a restaurant. I've always wanted to do this. And then you have the third group who have 57 ideas. Their head is full. They don't know which to choose. They've done a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of the other. They've tried everything and never made any progress on any of them. And they're still having ideas. <laughs> you talk through their ideas and they have ideas whilst you're talking about the ideas. Yeah, those three groups always show up at every one of our events. And everyone listening probably has some kind of situation in those three groups. And you do need, I think you do need those three types because you do need people. The people who are looking for their idea have got a hunger and know that they've got a worth. And they know that they can do something. They often tend to be the finisher, don't they? they? I just need to be told which direction and I will head in that direction. And then those people who have got that lifelong goal are passionate about something. And it's that third group who have ideas upon ideas that I really want to unpick with you today. Which of those three would you say you are? Because you come across on the podcast series as that latter camp, but also being a finisher. So where do you stand? I was always the ideas person. However, I have forced myself to become the finisher because I know the value is in the last 10 feet, the last piece, the last getting it over the line. And I never was a finisher. I would create half a website and move on to the next thing. I would build this and not properly sell it and move on to the next thing. And my granny's advice, stick with it, stick with it, rung in my ears whilst I never did. And it wasn't until I forced myself to start deciding and pushing something over the line. And Simon's also an idea person. So the two of us together, like you come out for breakfast with us, we'll have 57 business ideas by the time we finish breakfast. Like it can be paralyzing. It really can. And we've had to fight that over the years. Would you say, because you do appear to work really well together, but is is that a good combination to have of two idea people? Because... It comes across as a challenge. I've, I've always looked at strong partnerships as being one person is that starter and one person is that finisher, but you've obviously got it working with two ideas people. Is that through your forcing yourself to get it over the, ship, the finish line and shipping? I mean, that's it, isn't it? You've got to ship, haven't you? 
you've got to sell something to someone. And because I didn't make much money for my first couple of years in entrepreneurship, I realized that quite well, that's not that quick, is it? I was going to say I realized quite quickly, but it wasn't. It took a couple of years. Over 36 um, months, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that if you don't sell anything, you don't get to buy pizza. And I like food, so I wanted to sell more to earn more to buy more stuff. And I realized very quickly that I had to sell stuff and I had to finish things and I had to push it over the line. And that's not the natural space for me to be in. But I guess a word of encouragement for everyone listening If you push yourself to try something different, eventually it starts to feel like that's who you are. And I remember recently, so Simon was never the person who would force himself to take the awkward conversations and dive in. But I was the one who got sent in. And I would I hated awkward conversations. But after a while of doing them, I realized that your success in life is directly equal to the number of uncomfortable conversations you can have. So I started seeking them out. And then I went from, I don't like uncomfortable conversations to, where are they? Give them to me. <laughs> you were seeking them out. Right. Okay. I know. And then I disappeared from the business. And then Simon had to go through the same journey because I was no longer having them. And then he came like uh, probably a year later. He said, I've got to where you were. You, I'm up for it. Where's the awkward conversation? Send me in. But it's really interesting that definitely one of us had to take certain roles, but neither of us were natural at taking those roles we developed the skills to be that person because you had to so the ideas thing that's the if you like the nature part and the nurture part was you had to develop those finishing skills like that i'm 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 repeating that because it identifies and resonates really with me really well is that i could be relied upon to come up with and i can be relied upon to come up with ideas and you read those studies where they test creativity by giving someone a paper clip and a jam jar and say come up with as many ideas as you can and apparently people stop after three or four and I'm thinking I could do 30 of these I could do 40 of these and it is that getting over the finish line that I found most difficult so I was known as very much a starter with lots of ideas and I would imagine lots of the listeners if they're resonating with this have also got a drawer somewhere in their house which has got the half finished script the half finished book the first few tracks of the album that they've written something like that that package of ideas so what I really want to drill down on and, I, and identify is you've got five ideas in front of you how do you decide which is the one to work on Firstly, I love coming up with ideas. Like you and I could sit here, we could come up with 72 ideas. I'd love it. Then we have to decide what we want to do. I've got more, got more concise, more nuanced in how I choose ideas as I've got older. And my current strategy for choosing ideas is based on my values. And what I mean by that is the list of things that are important to me in life. Because As a 42-year-old, what is important to me now is vastly different to what was important to me as a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old. And they shift. So when you're choosing ideas, I used to go, okay, what's the quickest to implement and will make the most money? That was it. And then I shut out the ideas on that. I picked the one that hits the top quadrant. It's quick, it's easy, and I'll make a shitload of cash. That's the one I'll go for. But now I go, well, I'm 42. I'm financially independent. Money's lower down the list. I want to have fun. I want to have adventure. I want to make a difference in the world. So now my scales are how much fun can I have and how much difference can I make in the world? But it depends on where you are in your life as to what's important to you. It's really interesting you mentioned the scales because that's something I was considering is that are there, would you say, there are strong scales that you could put out and then You've got these 10 ideas that are banging around in your head. You could place them on there and and that would be a good system of identifying which idea to work on, do you think? That's what we do every year. So you'll laugh at this. Every year through building Pop-Up Business School into Rebel Business School, Simon and I had to go through through this process yearly of we've got these, I don't know, 10 viable business ideas that we've actually sold a bit of. Do we still want to keep doing Rebel Business School or should we just can it and launch games festivals? But if we didn't go through this process every single year at the annual retreat going, do we still want to run this business? Here's all the options. And then redeciding to fall in love with Rebel Business School again, we wouldn't have had the energy to keep it going. We would all have been tantalized by the shiny, the magpie effect of like, oh, the shiny new thing, give it to me. So that's what we did every single year was draw out that chart, place the ideas and go, 
actually, we should just do what we're doing. We love it. It makes a difference in the world. It's making money. So we had to rechoose every year. And you, right, okay. So you did the scales and you worked out, the, you, you went back to your values of, will this give me pleasure or not? Because you, there are ideas that, and, and I'm thinking of them, like I can think of some now that would, would make a lot of money, would be fairly easy to implement, but uh, my heart wouldn't be in it. I know those are the ones to, to drop quite quickly, you'd recommend, certainly. Uh, I mean, by virtue of the fact that I haven't done them, that, that flags up that they're <laughs> probably not good ideas. <laughs> not good ideas for me. Which what makes a good idea for you, Stephen, it makes it's different to what makes a good idea for me, which this is where it becomes tricky to give generic advice to people. But the generic advice is the process of thinking about it and then making your own decision through that process. So number one is answer the question, what's most important to you? And come up with a list of five, six, seven values, the things that are most important to you in life. Once you've worked that out, then, okay, from those values, these ideas you've got, which one brings you closest to what's important in life? Because some of those businesses will take you away from what's important in life, and some of them will move you towards it. And I have picked business ideas in the past that take me away from what's important in my life, and it just becomes painful later the line. Then you get the sunk cost stuff coming in and going, well, I started, I should push through, and but it's not right. And it just never leads to where you actually want to go in life. So at what point do you... And they talk in play terms about killing your babies and in writing terms about killing your babies. At what point can you and can you draw on some prior experiences where you've put some money, put a lot of time into an idea and you've realized that this is this is a dead dodo or you're you've you've started off and it's a nice shiny idea. And now with the grind of the job, it's actually not appealing anymore. So at what point were the signals there for you in the past? I think that's a really interesting question because. We all start stuff that ends up being something we didn't think it would be. And I've done that so many different times where I've started something, I've tried something. One example, I really wanted to help young people. So I decided that the way to get young people into entrepreneurship was to run a gaming festival because they'll all come out, they'll all play PlayStation, Xbox, they'll come and play the games. And then whilst we're there, we'll teach them how to build YouTube channels how to start businesses, how to get jobs as coders. Like, we'll get them excited. So the, the hook was the game, and then the thing was the thing. We spent nine months building this thing. We called it Void Gaming Festival. We had six, 700 young people turn up to the weekend. It was sponsored by Game. It was sponsored by Charlton Athletic Football Club. We had Charlton Athletic Football Club pros paying against the best kids from the tournament throughout the weekend. Like, it was an amazing thing. It was inspiring. It was a buzz. The amount of time and energy we put into it, we didn't, like, compared to the profit we made out of it, like, we didn't make a profit if you count the time, the love, the sweat, the energy. And it stuck there as an idea. It's still something we could run. I mean, it's still there. We just haven't. We refocused on the Rebel Business School. And I actually think if you're running a business long term over the years, you need a good diversion every now and again to remind you why you like your existing business. And you can also draw in lessons from, we've done this completely different thing, but actually I've learned an awful lot from that that can feed into the next part. And I think sometimes as you get older and as you get more established in a career or even a niche, you can become incredibly comfortable and incredibly grounded and you can just use Facebook marketing and you can just use blog posts. But if you are forced to take some sort of sabbatical from what you would normally do it can upset the apple cart in a good way that brings new ideas in would you say i mean i talked about them being your babies there is there's an idea that worked for you and you haven't passed that void gaming festival to someone else or bought someone in to do it or sell it is it because it's precious to you do you find it hard to let go of an idea uh, I guess first up, you know, if you're listening to this and fancy having a go at running an entrepreneurial gaming festival <laughs> for kids, let me know. I'll share what we did and we can do a partnership. For me, I have so many ideas, Stephen, that I don't really mind. And I think the biggest thing that has helped me, and this actually came from David Allen, the creator of Getting Things Done, he had the someday maybe list. Someday maybe I'll build this. Someday maybe I'll do this. So I don't feel like I've 
taken a pickaxe and killed my babies. I feel like I've put it on the someday maybe list and I'll come back to it if I want to. Um, So Void Gaming Festival's parked. Right. What I meant more was, do you have ideas that are so precious to you that you find it difficult to pass them on or let them go? I, I, I'm speaking here first from my perspective that when an idea comes, say it's a book idea, the idea comes and it's it is fully formed. So I can I can see the cover in my head. I can see the thickness of it. I can see the reaction to it and the response to it. And I find it really hard to divert from that and even harder to share that with someone with their own perspective, even though my experience has shown me that any time I share an idea, it's almost always improved. So it's a weird conflation there. Do you find it difficult to share ideas or are you just happy to pass them on? I have mixed feelings. I think it depends who you're sharing it with. There are people who will support your ideas and build them, build on them. And there are people that will rip your ideas to pieces. And one of the things that helped me is this thing called the Disney Creative Strategy. I don't know if you've heard of that. So he used to split the creative process up into three pieces. There was the dreamer, which is the person who just sits there going, these are the big ideas. There's the realist who goes, how does this actually work? How do we do this? What are the practical steps? And then there's the critic who goes, that won't work because, and gives you a huge list of all the flaws. They are all incredibly important parts of the creative process. However, if the critic comes in too soon, they will kill the idea. So what he did was the dreamer phase happens first and you dream about it and you spend like time doing that. Then he would physically move rooms and spend time on the realist. How do you actually make it work and spend days, sometimes longer on that. And then by the time he got to the third stage, the critic, the idea was well developed enough that it could withstand the critic. That's a really, really good model, isn't it? It's a really effective model. model. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know that he also came up with Imagineering, didn't he? Come come up with, come up with the idea and the, Imagine it and then engineer it back to reality. And I think that's so clever. So that can work with many different ideas, can't it? The idea is sitting in the dream zone and then you go, okay, is it possible? Do mice really need headphones? How is it possible, I think, is the question. Because if you ask, is it possible, it's a yes or no. And lots of people will say no. So I would say, how is it possible? Or how might we achieve this? How might we make it real? Which is an incredibly powerful question, because then it kind of goes you thinking forwards about like possibility rather than thinking about what could go wrong, because everyone will tell you what's wrong. Not very many people will tell you what could go right. Yes, that's right. And uh, everyone is willing to be a critic if they're given the leash, aren't they? We, we find, especially creative people, find criticism even well-intentioned criticism just such a painful thing to accept and it goes back to your baby's idea and looking after these precious things I would say that I've developed a thicker skin because now that I'm on Amazon I've had reviews which say that my books suck or they're rubbish or whatever and then you look at best-selling books like amazing million copies selling books and they also have this book sucked so you've got to you've got to accept that every every pot has a lid, right? And everyone's going to find something that they like and don't like. If I could tackle you more on that critic aspect, because I would also say that I've really improved as a result of listening to my critics and going, I don't like hearing what they've said, but they have got a point and I need to change something. So could you expand a little bit more on that, please? I think it's a timing thing. So critics are incredibly useful when the idea is strong enough. If the critic is at the start, the idea won't survive it. So I'm very careful about who I share my baby, baby, baby ideas with. Simon is actually wonderful because he, will, he has trained sentences he uses such as, what I love about that idea is, and he will find something he loves to help build it. He will use yes and. He will support the idea to grow whereas other people will just tear it down. And I've learned over the years, don't share it with them when the start. Just don't. Just keep it to yourself. Share it with people you trust. Write it down. Let it grow a bit. Think about it. And the timing issue is quite often you have meetings where you're sat around the table and there's two critics, two dreamers and one realist, and you're all trying to do your roles at the same time. 
and it just ends up in failure every time. And what you need to say is, okay, now we're in dreamer phase. Now we're in realist phase. Hold your criticism until we develop the idea enough that it can withstand it. Once it can withstand it, criticism is so valuable, so valuable. It helps you get better. But if you're too early, it can actually stop you from taking the next steps. So one experience of a critic making a positive influence on me was about a year and a half ago, launched a puzzle book that was in disguise of a very famous Scandinavian flat pack furniture company. And uh, we called it flat pack. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if anyone thinks of any Scandinavian flat pack furniture companies that release catalogs. So we made a catalog that was actually a puzzle book. And it did really well. We launched it on Kickstarter. It sold incredibly well. And one of the heroes of the puzzle community said very publicly, yeah, I didn't like it. Not many hints, sold it. Like, and, and it was like, this was maybe four weeks after it launched. And I was devastated. And we'd had contact before. And I thought, why didn't she message me? And then I realized that I was just taking it on board. That It was, it was one reaction out of maybe 800, 900 that we'd sold. But it did make me think really quickly, she wanted more hints. So we've got to work out a way of supplying more hints. So we built a, a hints app. And since then, we've built hints app for all the, all the puzzle books that we do. So as a result, although the criticism hurt initially, if I became detached from the emotion of that, it has improved the product overall. But the, the idea was fully formed then. So, I mean, it hurt, but she did have a point. I wish you'd I wish you'd done it in a better way. So you were saying about you were saying about you know, laughing in my pain. Um, you were saying about I'm of... laughing because I've been there. <laughs> yeah. I've been through exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And I think if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you are going to feel the pain Stephen and I are talking about. <laughs> it's going to happen. Expect it. It's going to be rubbish, but it helps you get stronger. Uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, you talked to, about Simon having these sentences that help build. Are there sentences and strategies when, when a friend is asking you for your reflective, reflective thoughts on an idea, is there a way that you can be kindly critical? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Right. Um, Teach me I them. Think... What is fun? <laughs> <laughs> you shall not to... criticise much. <laughs> yes. To criticise or not to criticise. I think because I've had so many of these painful conversations, I think... First off, it's the, this is my opinion, is very important to state because quite often people deliver criticism as if it is a fact, whereas actually it's just one person's opinion. So I will quite often start with, okay, these are just my thoughts and my opinions on how we could improve this. Feel free to let go of them if you want to or free, feel free to use them. And I kind of have that language at the start, which takes a little bit of pressure off. The second bit is... I always try and focus on what could be improved, not just what was rubbish. So you're adding value rather than depreciating the idea, yeah. Critics will quite often say, well, that was bad. I remember one piece of criticism. I used to be a member of Toastmasters. I love Toastmasters, where you deliver speech, you get feedback each week, and you get 40 or 50 slips saying what was good and what was bad. And one person just wrote, I hated your starting. Wow. And it's like... like <laughs> Can't Ouch. build on that, can you? Like, <laughs> what, what do I do with that? Like, why? How? Where? That's not good criticism. That doesn't help me improve as a as a speaker. There's a good place to go and test dealing with criticism. Is people are very genuinely nice at Toastmasters, but we also realise the only way to learn is to get criticism. So you have to have people say that. But they'll say, okay, so. The way I would say that is the beginning of your speech didn't resonate with me. The particular sentence that struck me was this. Why don't you try saying it this way and see how it resonates with the audience? So you've kind of said what the problem was, what specifically it was, and what you would do differently. And then someone has an actionable step to do with it rather than just, I hated your beginning. Yes, you can't, do, you can't do anything with that, can you? Because you don't know what they held, hated about that. So you're saying be really specific about it and suggestions for how to improve. This, it's the specificity. It is absolutely the specificity. So when I was giving speech feedback, and I still do from time to time, you, I will literally write down word for word what they say and then say, try saying it this way. And that 
is such a, a critical piece for someone to be able to change their language. Like we're just talking right now about language. One example would be, let's say someone was giving feedback on an idea and they go, well, I really like this part of the idea, but when you hear the word but, I give you an example, Stephen. I really like your stripy shirt, but... Yeah, I know, and I know what's coming is, and it's when people say, I don't mean to be rude, but, and then I'm going to be rude to you. Yes, yeah, you, you, you immediately build up a defense mechanism of, okay, here comes a criticism, doesn't it? it it's, it's an automatic thing because it, it offers a negative value, doesn't it? So when I'm giving feedback, I will say, I heard you say this, and then the word but, try changing it to say the first sentence, put a full stop, take a breath, and then go, my recommendation for improving is this. So don't have a but, because it negates the comment before. But it's the specificity of the feedback that allows people to make progress. If it's not specific, if it's very general, like you didn't deliver that feedback well, did you? What do I do with that? How do I get better? Nothing. Nothing you can do with that at all. So how do you, you, you're an ideas person. How do you keep a track of your ideas? Are you computer, phone, notes? What's the story? I love post-it notes. I love brainstorming with post-it notes, but then you have to do with something with them. And my best place for ideas eventually is OneNote. There's a Microsoft product. Uh, it's a free notebook facility, which I love. There's another one called Evernote. There's lots of different ones out there. I use OneNote and I literally have lists of ideas. I have some they may be lists. I have a huge number. Like if you ever need business ideas, just let me know. I have them written down. They're ready to go. But I love to brainstorm. And one of the things I've realized over the years is thinking the importance of thinking on paper. What I've realized is good about that is by typing or writing out your ideas, you are literally freezing the thoughts in your head so that you can later go back and examine them <laughs> and test whether they were any good or not. If it's just spinning around your head, you don't get the opportunity to freeze them and look them because they're just spinning around there. That importance of writing it down, getting it out, evaluating it, thinking about it critically is unbelievable. And it doesn't really matter what you use, pen, paper, OneNote, Microsoft, Evernote, like write them on your wall. I used to have a giant whiteboard on my wall in my bedroom. I loved it. The writer Anais Nin says, how do I know what I think until I've written it down? And I think that's a brilliant way of explaining. Like sometimes you can have the idea and it's fully formed, but, but until and someone asks you about it, but you can't explain it until you've written it down and almost written a pitch to yourself. OK, this is actually what I want to do. There's, a, there's also a huge value in having a series of notes and then discovering something that you wrote a year ago and it resonating with what you're thinking about now, going, ah, oh, now I didn't, that was like a half idea. I'd written it, parked it, forgotten about it, and it joins up with what I'm doing now. And those, those are quite exciting ones, aren't they? Those ideas that you can glue several things together with. I love that when that happens and I'm like, oh, and then I search through my notebook because it's electronic. You can just type in the search bar for some words and like, oh, I've got old notes about this and you pull it together. It is wonderful. Stephen, have you ever had the experience where you've had what you think is a good idea in your head, but then you say it out loud to another human and you don't even need their feedback when you're saying it out loud? You're like, how is this a good idea in my head? So for the last couple of years, I've had this idea for, and it should be a book, but in my head, it's a Netflix TV series. And I love crime thrillers. And I, I realized that I couldn't, I couldn't, it wasn't fully formed for me. And it wasn't fully formed until I could work out how to pitch it. And, and I thought, well, I need to pitch it really, really effectively. And so what I actually did was I made it up as a TV series. And we were talking at work about TV series that we were watching. And I said, has anyone seen Cul-de-Sac? And they said, well, what's Cul-de-Sac? I said, well, it's, it's a small cul-de-sac where everyone living there is in witness protection, but they don't know. And I thought, I'll see the, see, the, see the reaction to that. And they all went, oh, that sounds cool. And I thought, I've nailed it. If I've convinced them that this is actually a series rather than, that sounds rubbish, Stephen. <laughs> what the hell are you watching? Home's under the hammer for the win. Yeah. So that was the, um, yeah. So I thought just by pitching it as if it was a real thing. But until then, it was just an idea bouncing around. And I thought, no, I've got to be able to give it 10 seconds to friends who like the same sort of thing. 
but but self pitching is quite an important skill, isn't it? Because how are you going to sell an idea if you can't sell it to yourself? Well, I think the best way to do it is just to do exactly what you did and go and tell people about it. And I think Simon sometimes gets frustrated with me because I just start pitching ideas that aren't real yet. And <laughs> I went round pitching this Void Gaming Festival for ages. And then eventually someone said, that's a really good idea. And I just, every time I kept changing the language until eventually it landed. And that person said, yes, we'll run it. And I was like, oh, I've got a new business now. But I just randomly tell people my ideas. I've got this vision. What do you think? And someone says, yes, eventually. But the more I pitch it, the better my language gets, the more likely it will be real. The 20th time you pitch it, it's absolutely nailed because you're you're looking at a reaction from someone. You're looking at their eyes engaging. They want to bite your hand off or want to know more. But, but also, it's a very good way of testing. If after 10 goes, no one is going for it, then, <laughs> then you know. Yeah. I like the micro expressions. So I'll say my thing, and it's almost as if I lean in to look into their eyes yes. and go, Come on, What's give going me something, on? give me something, um, yeah. Does the mouth move? Do they change colour? Do they open their eyes? Do they close their eyes? Do they squint? Like quite often I pitch an idea and people pull the furrowed brow thing and you go, okay, I've not explained that well. Let me have another go. This is go. too complex, yeah. 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 <laughs> This, this sounds like everything that I've ever made and tried to explain to my mum. No, no, it's a it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle book, mum. It's a, but no, no, it's not an actual catalogue. No, you you can't you can't actually buy that sofa, mum. No, but just give it back, give it back. And I think there's I think there's a real value in actually sharing ideas because I know some creatives can be terrified. They think. So the cul-de-sac idea, the crime thriller where everyone's under witness protection, and they know, don't know. I've said that out loud. And I'm not worried and I'm not asking anyone to sign an NDA because, to be honest, I've had the idea for two years. It's still going to take me 18 months to write. If someone wants to steal that idea, good luck to them because it's going to take them longer than it's taken me. I've been carrying the idea. Do you think that people sometimes can be too protective of their ideas and it not allow it to expand? Yes. Like they are so paranoid about theft, so paranoid about theft of ideas. And they think that the one idea is game changing. Like, I've got this game-changing idea that's going to change the world, and I can't tell anyone because it's game-changing. It's unique. And if you believe you've got a unique idea, it's for one of two reasons. One is, it's truly unique, and no one's ever thought of it before. That's very, very, very rare. The second is, lots of people have thought it, tried it, and given up. You just don't know. That's probably far more likely in 90% of instances. And I remember... One particularly, we were running a pop-up business school in Birmingham, a rebel business school in Birmingham. And this lady came in and she wouldn't tell me her idea. Wouldn't tell me. She said, like, it's too important. And she wouldn't tell me, wouldn't tell me. And after about four days, we built up enough trust that she was like, okay, I'll tell you. And I was thinking, and I, I always, whenever someone tells me that I'm going to send an, sign an NDA before they tell me the idea, I put my head in the hands because I know it's not going to be original. Which is really weird. This lady then told me she was going to sell greeting cards that were cut slightly different shape to square. And like, I love her and I wanted her to succeed. But my head is going, this is not unique, original. I don't, you just need to produce them and sell them. And that's something she could quite easily mini experiment with as well, isn't it? She'd had that idea for years and never done anything about it because she couldn't get the money to be able to create the cutting machine to do the exact thing she wanted to produce a run to sell it. And there's probably a really, really good reason why that doesn't exist. So a book I was reading recently talked about patents. And 100 years ago, 99% of patents were inventions and 1% were innovations. And they classified innova innovations as two inventions together. So the Dyson would be a vacuum cleaner and air extraction. And now it's 99% innovation. So it's very, very rare to have an original idea. And yet people are desperate to have an original idea. So can you think of, and you talked about the game festival, that's a festival that appealed to teenagers. Now, most festivals are music for teenagers, but they're not for games. So that's again, innovation, two ideas that have been joined together. Can you think of other collaborations that people should explore if they're coming up with ideas? Are there, are there natural ways that you can get collaborations and innovations? Yes, there are natural ways to do it. And I think it is travel, experience, 
read, do stuff in different areas, go places, talk to people you would never speak to. We're in Colombia right now, and I've just played a game called Tejo, and it's unbelievably good. And I'm like, this could be amazing. This is a business in England. Basically, you have like a 10 meter thing in a cage. You've got a target that's got thick clay in it and a metal circle. And around the metal circle, you have four arrows filled with dynamite. What? And then you throw a very heavy metal puck at the circle with dynamite in it. And if you get it to explode, you get points. That's so, it's actual dynamite? Um, not dynamite, gunpowder, sorry. Slightly less risky, but actual gunpowder. It's still a proper bang, right? Mm-hmm. It That's scares amazing. me every time it goes off. And I'm like, this is the best idea ever. Someone should launch this in England. Someone should launch this in America. Maybe we'd have different health and safety rules. But you know what I mean. Like, it's phenomenal. But if you, if you don't travel, move around, go to different industries, look at things, try things, taste things, read books you wouldn't normally read, you can't combine those ideas. And I genuinely think one of the reasons I am creative is because I've had 12 different careers I speak to different entrepreneurs in different areas every day. Like I experience this in a different way every single day. And I get out there and live life and do all sorts of stuff. And that would be my advice to anyone like yours. You've got puzzle books, you've got games, you've got all sorts of ideas. And then you crash that with a furniture maker. And you could crash that with any type of industry. Like I think it would be incredible. Like I've been a landscaper for a while. You could do an entire puzzle book on landscaping and like garden maintenance and crash the two worlds together. Here's the piece. There's this thing in business called the unique selling proposition. And everyone's looking for how their idea is unique. And I think stop trying to be unique and just do something a little bit better. The key mm-hmm. there is selling. Yes, because don't have to be unique. You're absolutely right. There's there's a there's a company that I'm really not impressed with apart from their nouse because they've come up with crazy golf and they've done it indoors with cocktails. It's called junkyard golf and it's three <laughs> times the price. The cocktails are awful and it's packed and, and fair play to them because they're using these warehouses and these empty city center places and people are paying a huge amount of money to buy cheap and nasty cocktails and playing crazy golf. But it's a genius idea. Isn't it genius and and fair play to them because they've merged those two ideas together. So what do we do if we are a person at home listening to this and we're sitting on all these ideas, we've not done anything with them? What's the first thing that they should do, Alan? Pick one and realise there is no right answer. Like that is such a hard thing to realise. But there is no right answer. I don't know. Sometimes people have got these lists of ideas and they're waiting for one to be the thing. Like, I have to choose the one I'm going to follow and make real. I'd say to everyone listening, you are not committing your life to this idea. You are committing to run a mini experiment. Pick one. I don't care which. One that feels right. One that moves you towards your values. Pick it. Have a go. If it doesn't work, pick the second one. If it doesn't work, pick the third one. Otherwise, you will have those lists on your idea. Do you know the the wealthiest place in the world? I would have thought Dubai, but no, where is it? The graveyard. The graveyard. Because that's where most ideas end up. People take them to the grave with them. Absolutely, yeah. They die with them. Like, stop dying with your ideas and test some stuff. It doesn't matter which one. Yeah, if you never have a go, you never know. But that's a really tough thing to do. I know it's easy for me to say... But the worst but the worst thing about doing an idea and it doesn't work out is it doesn't work out. And all your guidance on Rebel Entrepreneur is don't spend forty thousand pounds building the restaurant before discovering that actually no one wants to eat macaroni cheese cereal. You know, you you actually do you test the idea first. So it's about choosing that idea, choosing the one that resonates most with you, the one that's been banging around your head the most, and do something with it. Yes. I 100% agree. You just remind me of Simon and I were in Kent running a pop-up business school, a rebel business school, and there's a guy in the front row. He wouldn't tell us what his business idea was. Always a red flag. You'll see a theme here. He wouldn't tell us. We spent four or five days getting to know him and eventually he told us. And it was an online dating portal website. And if women signed up to it, they would get a free watch. He'd spent 
£60,000 developing this website. He was so committed to this idea, so all in, and I just couldn't see it. And it's 60000 on his website. I just felt so bad because I felt like I could have knocked up a free one on Weebly that was better in about 20 minutes. It just didn't look good. It didn't feel good. And I, he was just holding on to it so tight because he'd invested all his life savings into it. And if he'd have knocked up a one-page website and tried it, he might have got feedback earlier on and he might have been able to change or move or do something different. So you talked earlier about the sunken cost fallacy and is it because he'd spent 60000 that he felt so far along that journey that he couldn't then backtrack and go, this actually is a dodo? It's tough, isn't it? It's so tough, yeah. So to everyone listening to this, just test it in the quickest possible manner. Have a go, see if it works. Then you'll start to make progress down your list of ideas and realise which ones are, as Stephen said, dodos and which ones are actual great ideas that you can do something with. The last thing to realise is you will never have time for them all. Just pick one and have <laughs> yes, a go. Yes, you'll never go. It's like your to-be-read list, isn't it? One thing that I have done in the past with ideas is actually put them out on social media and see which ones resonate because that that costs literally time that's that's there's nothing more than that and and i actually flag them up on twitter i do a little light bulb idea and put idea and what's interesting is i've i came up with an idea so one thing that hugely frustrates me is every website you go to the first thing that pops up is do you accept these cookies and every single time i click yes i accept all cookies and so i had an idea and i said idea something that automatically accepts all cookies every time a website goes on. And I thought that was a nice little idea. If someone liked it, it'd be interesting to do. Three or four people came back to me straight away saying, oh, try this app that does it exactly for you. Now, if you've put out those of ideas that you have and you discover that someone's already done them, you've saved even having to do a mini experiment. That's a nano experiment. Just asking in the, asking the world if it's already existing. From a personal perspective, it's a really good way of just testing out an idea really quickly. If 60 people like the idea, they'll let you know. If no one likes it, they won't mention it. So it's a really quick way. And also, you've got the advantage if you're terrified of NDAs, you can just delete the idea after 12 hours, can't you? It's it's free. The idea of the nano experiment. <laughs> <laughs> just ask people, does this exist? What do you think? I love that. I used to do a lot of work for Microsoft teaching them presenting presence, gravitas, communication skills. I had so much fun doing it. And every now and again, I'd have five ideas for courses for them. And I'd literally send the person I was working for an email and say, here's five course titles. What do you think? And they were literally just course titles. That's it. And sometimes I'd, there were crickets. <laughs> You'd get nothing back. And sometimes they would write back and say, that one sounds good. Tell me more. And then I would only develop the ideas that they said were good. Rather than making a slide deck for five different things and discovering that after six weeks of preparing that, only one is of interest. Yeah, it's it's testing the water, isn't it? It's been really, really fascinating talking to you, Alan. So, so thank you so much for your time. I'm going to very meekly hand back your podcast to you. I hope I've looked after it very carefully. And it'd be lovely to hear from listeners if, they've, if they do go ahead with those ideas, wouldn't it? Is there a way that they can get in contact with you? Oh, good question. Yes, uh, through alandonegan.com. You can find me there, uh, send me a message through the website or like other places. I'm less good at Twitter and LinkedIn. Like send me a message through the website. It's better. And before we sign off, Stephen, no one knows about your business. Tell us about your business. What do you do? They, they've got a few ideas. How can people find you in your business and what you do? That's very kind of you, Alan. Thank you very much. I've got two side hustles one that i work with with my friend and those are the books and that company is called escapages if you type in escapages on essentially anything you'll find our books so we've done a puzzle book based on a popular scandinavian furniture company uh, and we've done a murder trilogy where you've got the serial killers book and the the investigating detectives book we've done a band a fake band catalogue and then the other part of me is enigmailed and those are postal puzzles so the one that we have recently launched is called undeliverable and in the uk people across the world apparently this is common as well but in the uk especially if you're not in and they've got a parcel for you they put a little card 
through your letterbox. And there's a certain company in the UK, and I'm not going to mention their name, but they are renowned for giving you these cards and it's like a treasure hunt of where they've put the parcel. So is it is it behind the bin? Is it with your next door neighbour? Is it uh, in the bush? And uh, one day I came back and I'd actually ordered a puzzle game. And this company said, we've delivered it and we put it in your greenhouse. And I thought, well, that's intriguing because I don't have a greenhouse. So I looked around. <laughs> Sadly, I hadn't ordered a greenhouse. Otherwise, that would have been incredibly meta. Anyway, so I've got this puzzle game called undeliverable where you get a series of cards and it claims it knows where your parcel is and it gets closer and closer and there are puzzles buried within the card itself and it looks so genuine then that when i sent it out to play testers i've got about 30 play testers that are brilliant and they're all and they are your critical friend that we talked about earlier that some of them said i'm sorry i don't remember and ordering anything in the in the first place because it was so genuine and they didn't see at first that it was a puzzle game so that's that's the stuff I do. That's the stuff I do. It's it's fun escapism, but there's someone who phrased it really nicely online that you don't have to be a genius to work out the puzzles, but you end up feeling like a genius when you do. So that's that's the thing that we're aiming for. So that, that little feeling inside of, eh, I'm a little bit clever, I've worked out that little that little cipher. Yeah, that's what we do. I love that. I love that. So please check out Stephen's games. Have a search for them. See what he's up to. Because I always find it fascinating, like how people build businesses. And who knew 2020 and 2021 were going to be the years of puzzle games, escape games? Like yeah, this it's is a massive, thriving, growing massive. market. Yeah, it's massive. And what's interesting, because one of your in season one. You had a couple who were in Reading who do the, the they built their escape room, didn't they? And they started off, and that was a brilliant mini experiment, didn't they? Didn't they find a, a space in a local shopping centre to start off with? Am I thinking? Yeah, Katie right and people? Andrew That's time it. trap yes. escape rooms. Yeah. yeah, they did a, a mini experiment of two days in a festival, and then they found a, a hotel that had a spare room and did a pop up, and yeah, they really lived that whole mini experiment thing. That ju- their journey is a really good blueprint isn't it for don't invest everything don't put your all into it well during the pandemic a lot of the uh, the panic rooms and escape rooms were closed down and one of two things happened either they closed and that was it they've gone for good there was the other group that pivoted and went okay let's do things online so they got games masters doing the escape rooms with cameras so you were in the their live or they would do virtual reality ones or they would do print and play ones at home they all pivoted and it's about that innovation again if we can't get people into our escape rooms let's take the escape rooms to them let's use that as lasting inspiration for people if you're if you're reaching a cul-de-sac you can pivot and find another way of getting your idea out there right right i love that please (laughs) smash some ideas together and see what happens absolutely Uh, Stephen. Thank you for taking over the podcast. You, this has been an utterly fascinating, fun conversation. Slightly awkward being on the other side of the table rather than asking the questions. I'm not used to being on this side of the table. Well, uh, it's a lovely table, so you can have it back now, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're listening to the podcast, the closing message for you is it does not matter what idea you choose. Pick anything, run a nano experiment make it happen, get it out there and just try it. You will never know which idea is best until you have a go. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a rebel entrepreneur.